Well, good morning, and thank you for joining us. I also want to say thank you to Dr. Stefan Howland, who gave us grand rounds this morning. Really, he's an expert in so many aspects of endovascular treatment of aortic disease. Last night, he talked about 3D imaging and uh, how we reduce the radiation exposure. And this morning, really kind of talked to us about new technologies and addressing the aortic art. So, Stefan, first of all, Thank you. Thank you for being here. Great talks. Thank you very much, Alan. It's, uh, I'm very happy to be here. And uh, this shared experience uh, has been uh, uh, really interesting. I'm very impressed by all the work that's going on here. And I'm very happy that uh, we managed to find time to collaborate. Yeah, he flew in yesterday uh, from Paris and is flying back out this afternoon. So very much a whirlwind visit and we appreciate the effort. All right, so let's get down to business. Um, you run an aortic center. Tell me about the aortic center, what the components of it are, how you run it, and what I'm fascinated about what you're doing is how you are so productive from an academic standpoint. So let's start by uh, how to run an aortic center. And I think that the key is to have um, expertise in all the areas, uh, all the treatment areas of uh, aortic uh, treatment, uh, meaning that uh, you need to have the uh, perfect imaging, you need to have the perfect ICU, you need to have the open skills, you need to have the endo skills, meaning that you need to have a, a, a transversal approach uh, to the problem. You need to discuss all those cases with CT surgeons, cardiologists, ICU people, and anesthesiologists. So the way we work is we're all part of the same group, and uh, we discuss every single case and try to find the best option for each patient. Is it open? Is it endo? Is it both? Uh, we figure out and uh, as you've seen in my slides we have a very stage approach to reduce the, the mobility associated with those uh, uh, quite extensive uh, uh, repairs and uh, by having this approach we've really significantly reduced the morbidity and mortality associated with, the, with those repairs. Now having said that how uh, do we manage to, to, to publish uh, mm -hmm. all those results? Uh, the idea is to, um, I, I've learned that from Roy Greenberg, and I think whatever you do, uh, you need to make sure uh, that uh, your patient will benefit from it. So you need to, to describe the, the technique and you need to evaluate short, midterm and long-term outcomes just to make sure that you're going in the right direction. It's not about um, the technical challenge, it is about patient care in the long run. So we've always um, worked uh, with research nurses and with the research fellows from abroad that come to get some specific uh, training on, on that uh, on those complex uh, aortic repairs <coughs> and uh, making sure that uh, we would collect the data prospectively and then at one point um, analyze the data and, and share it uh, with the rest of the world. So, so let me press you a little bit on the, the operational aspect of it. Do you have a joint clinic? Do you, is a patient referred in to an aortic clinic where you have multiple different specialties seeing that patient same day? So the patient is referred to either a CT surgeon or myself, but we, have the, we run our clinics um, just next to each other. Mm -hmm. So if I see a patient that I believe would be better off uh, treated uh, open by a CT surgeon, uh, I just ask him to come in the room and to, to see the patient. And having said that, uh, when uh, we inform the patient that we will, uh, in conference, uh, take a look at uh, his CT scan, at uh, all the information we have on, 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 his, uh, on his file, and then make uh, a consensus uh, decision on the best way to treat the patient and when we contact him. So the patient is informed right from the beginning that it's a team that's going to take care of him. It's not me or the CT surgeon. It's all of us together. And so you have a joint aortic conference in addition to that where you discuss these cases? Yeah, once a week uh, we discuss all those cases uh, uh, together and we file uh, those discussions and so it's a consensus decision on what's the best way to, to fix uh, all, all those uh, aortic cases. And, and in terms of follow-up, I presume you have patients come from far and wide across mm -hmm. France and so do you ask them all to come back to your center for the mm -hmm. imaging follow-up? So that's a critical point. Uh, we cannot get all the patients to come back, especially when they come from uh, uh, the Middle East or, or, or other uh, uh, remote places uh, f in France or, uh, or Europe. Uh, the, uh, so what we ask is, is actually every time they do a follow-up imaging, to, they send yeah. it to us. And our research nurses, uh, our, our assistants, will contact the patient to make sure that we get uh, those follow-up uh, CT scans and we analyze them and we stay in touch with the referring surgeon or referring uh, uh, cardiologist. Very interesting. So let me go back to your journey of how you got here. In particular, I really want to focus on Roy Greenberg, the Cleveland Clinic. Um, I actually didn't realize that you spent time with him. I should have guessed. <laughs> I should have known that. But um, 
there are so many people who else who are leaders in what doing what you're doing at the moment spent time with Roy at the Cleveland Clinic so uh, so the uh, the first one that came after me and replaced me uh, as a, a research fellow uh, at the Cleveland Clinic was Tim Resch uh, who was uh, at that time from Malmo in Sweden, who has now moved to Copenhagen in, in Denmark. Uh, then Tara Mastracci arrived, Matt Eagleton was uh, already there, and then a couple of um, physicians from the U.S. Uh, had a specific aortic fellowship uh, with Roy, uh, including uh, Andy Schenzer, Gustavo Odrich, and, and, and many others. And we've been exposed to his radical thinking, we've been exposed to his um, thinking out of the box, I, I would say, but having said that, he would always do things um, in, in a very sensitive way, meaning that he would discuss all the cases um, in conference and everyone would agree that uh, it was the best way to do it. And he always uh, uh, ma made sure that all patients were enrolled in uh, clinical studies to be able to collect data and, and to analyze what he was doing. And so we've, we've learned from him so much. Uh, what everything I do today is everything that I learned uh, uh, from Roy uh, uh, at that time. And what is interesting is uh, I spent over a year at the Cleveland Clinic. I was just a clinical fellow, so I just watched. I didn't do anything. Mm. But by watching Roy in clinic, I watching him in the OR, uh, watching him size the endograft, I knew that uh, how he would tackle uh, any issues um, during a, a, a challenging case. I knew he had a plan A, B, C. I knew that uh, I, I needed to really look at the pre-op imaging thoroughly before getting scrubbed. Uh, I knew that actually when I came in the OR, all the case was already done because uh, the, the, uh, the, the plan, all the steps of the procedure had been uh, uh, put down on, onto paper. Well, that's pretty remarkable, the influence that not just one person, but he was certainly a leader in that, has had in terms of promulgating this kind of technology. And I'm sure to be very proud of what you and others have achieved. And, and, and uh, the, what is interesting is that he was uh, ready to share all his knowledge and spend time to explain uh, his approach and uh, w you know the, the, his uh, usual quote was why would you do that and so then you had to sit down and, and, and discuss and uh, well, the interesting thing is because he uh, opened his door uh, to a, a French tourist that uh, arrived over there um, and I, I learned so much from him I did the same then when uh, fellows would travel from any place uh, uh, of the globe uh, to my place but so did Gustavo so did Tim Resch, Tara Mastracci or Matt Eagleton uh, because uh, this is the way we were trained and so I think it's how uh, and this is uh, how you do it here at the Methodist uh, you need to work as a team you need to have people from all over the world uh, to come and this shared experience is, is, is I think of uh, paramount importance okay so what are you most proud of what you've achieved and you obviously moved from Lille to Paris mm -hmm. um, why and, and what is the next level that's going to take you uh, up a level in your academic career mm -hmm. So th the main reason for me moving to Paris, uh, well, there are many reasons. So mm -hmm. One was uh, for the family. My, my two kids were already uh, all the kids in, in Paris. Um, in, in my center in Paris, um, this is the highest level of um, complex open surgery uh, that is performed. They, they do a lot of uh, lung transplant, pulmonary artery, endarterectomy. Uh, they do uh, a lot of uh, open uh, complex stuff. And so they, ha they have a fantastic ICU uh, working uh, over there. So the idea was to have uh, the best of the open uh, skills and to uh, bring my endovascular expertise and together uh, have a, a, mm -hmm. a new approach. And that was the, the main reason for me moving there. It's a very e efficient place. It's, it's, it's a, a small but works really nicely. Great. So one of the reasons we do this, these little interviews now, was really because of Roger Greenhall. Mm. Um, he came here to give grand rounds, same podium you were at a couple of years ago, and he did it with uh, recordings, video recordings with Dr. DeBakey. Dr. DeBakey was traveling through London, and he said, hey, I want to interview you. And he had it all on camera, and I thought, what a great idea is to take people from behind the lecture, uh, the lectern and just talk to them. So. What would you like to talk about? So what, what really stimulates you and what keeps you going and, and what, what makes you excited to come to work in the morning? Well, the, the idea is to learn every day. And, and you learn from the young ones, you, you learn from the more experienced one, and you, you learn from traveling. Uh, if I'm here today, uh, it's to give a lecture, but mostly it's actually to, to see your mm -hmm. facilities, to see how you train your young ones, mm -hmm. to see uh, your research program. So 
every morning uh, I wake up with the idea of uh, uh, what uh, new program uh, are we going to run, what research uh, are we going to perform, and uh, how can we interact with other fields, imaging, uh, how can we uh, interact with R&D from the, the graph companies, this is also something I learned from Roy, need to work with the engineers from the companies to, to, to improve patient care, and so that's really what is uh, uh, is making me move forward is to be able to, 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 to share expertise from uh, different backgrounds and uh, because otherwise doing the same thing every day would not be uh, that exciting. No, no, very interesting. So one of the things that I didn't know about you, likewise, we always get to know more about you with your background in biomaterials. And so I mentioned to you yesterday, we just opened a new medical school, a whole new concept, it's called NMED. And you've got to be an engineer to get into that medical school. You've got to be an engineer entrepreneur to come into that medical school. And they're all going to have to find people like you who are on the clinical service here that they're going to work with to tackle a problem. And so we're very interested in how we integrate the engineers, you know, particularly the entrepreneurial engineers, into our service line. So what lessons you know, have you learned kind of over the years? Because you know, one of the things, I mentioned you were on this meeting called Pumps and Pipes. These are people from completely mm. different backgrounds, and it's an exercise in communication. And so, and I see a lot of opportunities to get lost because the engineers talk here and the docs talk here, and they fail to get down to a commonality where they can understand that. And so, what kind of challenges have you noticed in working with engineers over the years? So, so the program you're describing, uh, we, we've built a very similar program with the uh, Ecole Polytechnique, which is kind of the mm -hmm. top uh, engineer program uh, uh, back in France, not far from my hospital. And um, we're building a new hospital, and we will have uh, research facilities in the hospital where those guys uh, will be uh, spending time. I think what we've learned is that if you want to, um, if the engineers work on, on their side, they will come up with uh, options that uh, there is no benefit for the patient. If we do it on, on our side on our own, we don't, uh, we cannot, mm -hmm. uh, we don't know what the new technologies are. So, so we really need to combine the expertise and we need busy, us busy uh, surgeons to find time, to dedicate time um, to uh, this uh, research, transactional research. So I think it's, it's definitely the, the, the way to go. Um, in France, we've been not good at uh, taking time out of the um, surgical uh, uh, practice, but now we suddenly uh, realize that uh, if we really want to fly, we need to have at least a full day uh, dedicated uh, to, this, uh, to the collaboration with the engineers. Okay, so you and I have been talking, but there's also an opportunity for the audience to actually send in questions. And there's a couple of questions you have to text to Bake 37607, and you can send in questions. And there's a couple for you. You mentioned the importance this morning of endo and open expertise. Okay, that sounds great. Now, how are we going to ensure our trainees get exposure to both of these? The, the only way to, to have the trainees to get exposed and, and, and train in both open and endo is to have training programs in high volume centers. Um, it's funny, when I moved uh, to my new center, they were almost only doing uh, open. You would think that by uh, me coming there, uh, the endo, the Why open would- Why would they want you? Uh, the, the open would go down yeah. and the endo up. Yeah. Well, actually the endo went up significantly, but so did so the did open. The open. Yeah. Uh, because again, uh, I, I'm not uh, promoting endo uh, over open, I'm just trying to figure out what's the best option for, for each patient. So we discuss all those cases and because many patients are referred um, uh, to, to me uh, will finally end up with, with, with open surgery. Mm -hmm. um, we are a high volume centers in both open and endovascular. So our trainees uh, do rotation. Uh, they, they spend every month, they come, uh, they are either in the hybrid room or uh, in the open rooms. And so they, they, we have uh, three fellows and they rotate uh, two in the open, one in the endo. And mm -hmm. so by the end of their two year fellowship, they have been exposed to both open and endo. All right. Yeah, I mean, we're fascinated uh, a little bit by what's happening here is that we now train vascular surgeons out of medical school. Five years, you're trained vascular surgeon. But because we're so integrated with cardiac surgery here, our trainees rotate with the cardiac surgeons. Um, they're, they're our partners. And two or three of our vascular trainees are now gonna do cardiac surgery. And I really think this is a way that cardiac surgery can be transformed. 
uh, because our guys know how to sew an anastomosis, guys and gals actually, increasingly gals, know how to sew anastomosis, they know about imaging, they know about catheters and wire skills, and that can be transplanted. And so we talked a little bit about when I came down to Houston, the, the word that was pervasive was cardiovascular. I went, that doesn't exist as a specialty. But the more experience that I've got, I suddenly realized there was a lot of wisdom in that and that we're kind of going back to the future. And I know you've kind of got some opinions upon how you work together with your cardiac surgeons. So this is a very uh, highly sensitive uh, Very sensitive <laughs> question. Uh, we have to parse our words as vascular exactly. surgeons very carefully. There's, uh, there's a lot of <laughs> politics involved, yeah. but uh, when I look at the, uh, the field of cardiovascular surgery, I think there's part of it is really cardiac surgery, uh, transplant, um, a valve repair, thing like this. Uh, part of it is really vascular, uh, which is peripheral, um, AV access, thing like this. And then you have the aorta in, in the middle. And I think if you want to be a, a good aortic surgeon, so you need to be both exposed uh, to cardiac surgery and, um, and, the, and the vascular and, and, and vascular surgery. So um, we need to, to, to be able to, to have a training program combining um, uh, exposure to, to both cardiac surgery and, and vascular surgery. And, and we need to have um, a, uh, a treatment uh, path that includes uh, both expertise. When I do my endovascular arch repair, I scrub in with a CT surgeon mm -hmm. uh, bec because this is the safest way to do those procedures. Mm -hmm. and anything goes wrong, I cannot fix it. So, I mean, we need to be able to, to, to work together. Um, obviously, every center is different. Every country is different. There are uh, financial issues. There are political issues. But at the end, uh, patient care is what uh, we are doing. And, and I think that uh, having a, a combined approach is the best. Yeah. So one of the arguments I've had, <coughs> obviously I'm a vascular surgeon, is do societies exist to protect a specialty or do societies exist to improve the vascular care mm. or the cardiac care mm. of the general public? Clearly it's both. But at the end of the day, I think being able to improve the cardiovascular health is our primary mission. And we got to figure out the politics, you know, that get in the way basically of doing that. I said it, you didn't say it, I'll take the blame. No, no, but okay. uh, you know, mm -hmm. as um, the ESVS uh, president, mm -hmm. uh, I've been a, a lot involved in, in those discussions. And what I can tell you is, for example, for the guidelines, so we published a, com uh, uh, a combined or, uh, guidelines between the A e A C T S and ESVS for the arch, and we're uh, um, are going to update our thoracic uh, out, uh, uh, guideline soon and some of the chapters will also uh, be um, written down by a, a co uh, collaboration between cardiac surgeons and vascular surgeons. So, so we're going during, uh, we, I mean we need to have this uh, uh, sensitive approach. Okay, so one other question, probably from one of our residents I would imagine given the flavor of it. Do you have an approach to resident didactics and education both in and out of the operating room that has worked well for you and your trainees? What, what's your philosophy and how do you kind of engage education. Well, we all have certain didactics we got to teach and you teach in the operating room. Is there a way of, how do you, how, how do you basically do it? Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, first we have conferences where uh, we discuss all the cases like uh, uh, this morning and um, and it's very important to, to, to show them that there are many ways to tackle uh, uh, one problem and we need, get, need to get them involved in those conferences to present the cases and everything. Uh, then there's a treatment path and we, we try to make this uh, very crystal clear on, on a patient that comes to the hybrid room that uh, making sure that uh, uh, they've been prepared the, uh, uh, the right way. What we've done on top of that is what I've seen uh, today at the Methodist is uh, we've had a specific uh, training program that is, uh, is not on patient. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a hybrid room dedicated to research and, and training. We have uh, 3D prints that are connected to a positive flow. So the, uh, the residents and the fellow, they can do a, a IDEC branch, a fenestrated uh, a repair um, in a real life environment, uh, exposed to radiation. So they, they learn how to use this advanced imaging application. They learn how to use those uh, complex uh, endograft. And so th the next day when they in the OR uh, to help us uh, perform those cases, they fully understand uh, what's going on. And then we can slowly get them to do those cases in, in, a, in a very uh, safe and progressive uh, uh, way. Yeah. Very good. Let me pick your brain on one last thing, and that is, as a European who came to the United States, I came here because all the new technology was mm. taking place in the United States, only to find that it actually was now moving to Europe, and Europe was on the vanguard of getting all the new cutting edge technologies. But that regulatory environment in Europe is changing. So can you, mm. can you talk a little bit to that? So I'll tell you a, a joke. Um, a couple of years ago, 
we would say that uh, any uh, new technology uh, will first be implanted in humans uh, in Australia, then in Europe, then you would have animal models, and then it will come to the US and finally to, to Japan. Um, this obviously is changing. The new European rules are um, much more, um, how would you say, Exigent, we say in French, exigent. Uh, um, so we now need to go through a, a whole process that makes full sense, but that means that uh, we will have access to all those new devices after you uh, in the US. So we've been spoiled uh, during many years uh, having access to all those uh, uh, new devices. Um, probably things are going to change now in the, in the, in the near future. You will have access to the device uh, first. What is interesting is we still need to have centers that will evaluate those uh, new technology and will share it with the rest of the world. And I think what's going to change also is rather than having European and FDA trials that are performed separately, we will have global trials for and, and notified bodies will work on uh, global data. And I think this is really the, the, the way forward. Um, currently for fenestry and branched uh, endografting, the best data available is the US IDE consortium. Um, the 10 ID centers are combining all their prospective uh, um, and, um, database. Uh, you know, this is what we need to do, is, is gather data from everywhere, have the same um, database okay. and, 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 and share experience. All right, so you got one more question. Based on your experience, how do you see medical device and imaging companies coming together to solve complex clinical challenges? So that is a, a very interesting uh, question. I think why, why robotic companies have failed in the past is that we, you had the, the robotics on one side and the imaging on, on the other side. Now if you combine robotics with a, a 3D imaging data set, and then suddenly you can ask the robot uh, to go towards a target vessel without touching the Arctic wall, so uh, avoiding all, all the uh, trash uh, uh, emboli and uh, making all those complex procedures uh, much more uh, uh, simple and, and with uh, better outcomes. So it's an evolving field and, and obviously um, very soon, and you're working on this uh, here, you'll be able to, to do a procedure from, from your uh, smartphone in a patient that is uh, a couple of uh, thousand miles away. Um, is, this is, was not yet there, but uh, we're moving uh, uh, forward. And the key is, is really to connect uh, all those um, uh, robotic uh, devices to the 3D imaging. And until we have uh, those uh, companies uh, uh, working together, uh, we'll, uh, when uh, they will be working together, we will be able to tackle much more challenging uh, pathologies. So it's, it's a very interesting stage in that evolution. I mean, you, you got to give credit to Philips, kicked this off with mm -hmm. the acquisition of people like Spectronetics, mm -hmm. and now you've seen Siemens by uh, Corundus. And, you know, I've always felt that the link between the imaging companies and device companies, with people like you and me going, mm -hmm. you guys really need yeah. to be talking to one another, mm -hmm. but you're actually mm -hmm. seeing it starting to happen mm -hmm. at the moment. So within the, the extent that you can, can talk about it, can, what, what can you tell us about shape sensing technologies? Which technology? Luna. Uh, Luna, the force, you call it? Yeah, the, the force. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's one, uh, this, this is one uh, optical uh, element. This is one of the technologies out there that is going to change uh, in the, uh, the, the hybrid room uh, setup. So what is the hybrid room? Uh, how will the hybrid room look in 10 years from now? Will we be using um, uh, radiation? Probably yes, but how much of it will be under uh, X-ray guidance? I'm not sure because force technology is there, because electromagnetic fields are here, because MRI is on its way, because ultrasound and 3D ultrasound, all those non-radiation uh, technologies are there uh, to, to help us perform those procedures in reducing our exposure to radiation. Because they, when I see a young vascular surgeon today, I know that uh, he's gonna be exposed in. 80 or 90 percent of his practice to radiation. Uh, so first we need to make sure that we protect ourselves correctly um, currently and then we need to, to move forward with all those new technology evaluate and some of them will be uh, using routine practice uh, later on and the one nice thing about those technology, if I, I think about the force, for example, is it can actually bring you to to a very extreme angulation that you cannot yeah. uh, mm. um, uh, have with the uh, with your gantry with your your C arm. So it's going to help you like uh, have uh, information such as information you would get with the biplan, but without doing any uh, radiation. So I, I think it's it's the way forward. But I cannot tell you tomorrow which of these technologies uh, will be prominent in the hybrid room. 
Stefan, I could pick your brain all day because you're such a font of knowledge about some things that I'm very interested in. But thank you very much indeed for coming over here. It's really been a transformational visit from our standpoint. Of view. And thank you for your mm -hmm. invitation. And I've been really impressed uh, with uh, all uh, the research going on here mm -hmm. and uh, with all the education facilities that you have. It's a, uh, truly uh, the way to go. And uh, I've learned a, a lot. Uh, only 24 hours, but uh, it was really worth the visit. Thank For you so much. The first of many. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adina. It's real, that a was real great. pleasure. Yeah. Thank you, Alan.